I'm going to bring out um, Tim Rowe, and this will be a little different. Uh, we'll have sort of a dialogue back and forth. Um, Tim is the head of the Cambridge Innovation Center. Um, and for those of you, we don't have mics here, uh, but if, if, you, if you all want to tweet us a question, you could tweet it to at Roe or at Bruce underscore Katz. Oh, I forgot my iPad, but um, I'll, we'll figure it out. Someone will, will yell up the question. Um, yeah, I'll come get it. So, you know, Mayor Burke brought up this issue of innovation districts. So what is happening around the United States and in Europe uh, is that the geography of innovation, which used to be really completely suburban, auto-dependent, is collapsing back into the cores of central cities, generally nestled against advanced research institutions and, and medical campuses. And the Cambridge Innovation Center uh, is located right smack in Kendall Square, which may be really the iconic innovation district in the United States right now. Let's start with some easy questions. Cambridge Innovation Center has been called Silicon Valley in a building, or maybe two or three buildings. Um, just what does that mean? Okay. Thank you, Bruce. Can, can everybody hear me? So first of all, I just want to share some good news. I think I'm the last speaker. <laughs> uh, and because I don't really want to share this information with you without being sure you're awake, I'm going to start by asking you a couple of questions. Uh, this is very important, and Mark, you can't answer. What machine in a tech shop is the gateway drug to being part of a makerspace? Anyone? Please. Please. All right. How much does it cost you to buy a set of furniture for a public park in Sweden? $1,100. All right. Good. So we no longer have any concerns about the awake. <laughs> There's an awake and alert audience. We can move on to the content. Thank you very much. So uh, I'm Tim Rowe. I'm the founder and CEO of Cambridge Innovation Center. Uh, CIC started like many of the co-working spaces that you have in Pittsburgh, and you have some great ones. Uh, we were a bunch of friends out of MIT. Uh, I married a young woman that I met at MIT. She wanted to start a startup. I sort of did too, but I, I didn't know what I wanted to do. So I said, I'll get the space, I'll get the furniture, uh, and you know, we got going. I think it was like $1,100 at Ikea, and, and we were all set. Um, we, we, we went out to rent a space, and we found that the landlord said things to us like, uh, well, we'll need a three to five year commitment and a personal guarantee. And we, we kind of did the math, and we were like, so you'll take my house if my wife's startup doesn't work out. And they said, well, yeah, that's pretty much it. And I said, well, that, that doesn't make any sense. And th I think this is why a lot of us got into sharing space with startups. It just, the old way didn't make any sense, right? And so a bunch of our friends at MIT said, hey, could we you know, bunk in with you? Could we share that? It grew from two companies to five companies to 10 to 20 to 50 to 100 to 200 to 400. And we're now at about 800 companies sharing. We're now, we've sort of overflowed the building we're in to several buildings nearby. We've added wet laboratories, kind of like tech shop, but, but with you know, test tubes. Uh, we've got added, um, uh, just about every possible kind of device or, or space that you would need. We even have a nuclear power startup in the space. Uh, you don't want to know about all the details of that. Um, this is, uh, we think now, the world's largest cluster of startups in one place. And uh, I'm happy to answer more questions about it. Yeah, I, before when we've been together, you said, you know, everyone's heard of incubators, everyone's heard of accelerators. We're a concentrator. Yes. What, what do you mean by that? Okay, so, uh, so in this, I've been doing this for 15 years, and apologies if this gets a little wonky, but there, there have emerged some different words to describe different ways you can support startups, and we've heard a lot of them today. Um, an incubator, the word incubator is typically used for the kind of the first generation, the 1.0, often run by governments. The idea was, let's get a space, let's make it cheap, let's provide some capital and maybe some mentors and see if we can get some companies going. Uh, the next generation, uh, accelerators are the popular word today. There are groups like Y Combinator and Techstars, and there are a number of groups here in Pittsburgh uh, that are usually much shorter, like three months, come in, get some money, get some advice, but really quickly and get out. And some of them become quite successful. Uh, there is uh, co-working spaces, which, are, which most people are familiar with. This is kind of a room, a box, a bunch of people. Usually it's very open, uh, big, big tables. You kind of sit around the table. It's relatively cheap. 
Uh, it's a great place to start when you don't have much money and, and uh, meet some other people and get going. Uh, there's something that, that's emerged in a few places which is like that, but, uh, but it continues to follow the companies as they grow. Um, so, and Cambridge Innovation Center is one of those. We've allowed companies to go from that one or two people to maybe five or 10 in real offices, to maybe 20 or 50. Um, there are some folks here from Google. Uh, Google's Android project started just, as just a couple people, one in CIC and one on the West Coast, uh, and grew to about 200 people inside CIC. Uh, a company called HubSpot that some of you may know, it's a public company that uh, is really changing the way marketing is done. Uh, started as one or two people, grew to about 200. So there, it's like this notion of co-working, but it follows the companies on up. Now, what, what's interesting when you, when you do that, when you get to these, this spread of ones and twos all the way up to the 200s, and you somehow manage them to get all in one physical, concentrated space, is that there's a kind of alchemy that occurs. The first thing that happens is it becomes visible from afar. We call this a beacon effect. Uh, so if you took all the startup activity in Pittsburgh, and there is a lot of startup activity in Pittsburgh, and you somehow put it all in this building, just as a thought experiment. So every last startup was in this building. What would happen is, first of all, they would start helping each other in ways that it's hard for them to help each other when they're separated. The second thing that would happen is that when Kleiner, Perkins, Caulfield, and Byers sends Bing in here to give a speech, he'd make sure he came and walked through that space because people would talk about it. It would be, it would be a beacon, if you will, It'd draw people in. Uh, what we found is that, uh, and so we call this a concentrator, by the way, to answer the question. Uh, what we found is that uh, initially we'd start getting those VCs saying, hey, maybe I should come by and check this out. I've heard, I've heard there are a lot of startups in this place. I should probably look at that. And then they would start saying things like, gee, um, do you, know, do you think we could put a person kind of always in an office there? And then they would say, do you think we could move the entire firm into CIC or one of, into the building with it? Um, and recently, in the last few years, I think we've had three funds over $2 billion of venture capital each that have moved their entire headquarters into the buildings with us, just to give you an idea. So what happens with this beacon effect is it, it's sort of, it's like moths to a light. It's not changing the amount of innovation you have. It's just an effect of concentrating it that then starts to draw in other kinds of uh, activity and support, and it builds on itself. I see Mark nodding because he sees the same effect. I know we've talked about this in Tech Shop. And in fact, Mark and I are building one of these in St. Louis where there's a CIC and there's a Tech Shop right next door, and that gets it even stronger. So you're, you're leaving or you're expanding into St. Louis, you're also talking about expanding into Rotterdam. Um, will those places, I mean, you know, Kendall is critical. I mean, it's explosive, in part because of MIT, in part because of the innovative strategies of MIT. So can you take this model and really go into some other places? I mean, St. Louis does have WashU and so forth. I mean, does the model have to change, right. or does, uh, or right. kind of just really move right in? So, can this idea of building a concentrator work outside yeah. of uh, Kendall Square? So, I'm going to give you two, a two-part answer. The first part is it has to. Right. Okay. Um, somehow, I walked on here, and I don't think I got a clicker. But do you have I a got clicker? One. Okay, here. <laughs> I'm, I want to show you. Let's see if this works. Not that one. This one. How many people I have seen this one. slide? It's not mine. It was the Kaufman Foundation. Okay. Uh, half a dozen people, good for you. So this, if, this is the most important data I can share with you today. Uh, and you might come away thinking this is the most interesting piece of data, or one of the two or three that you'll remember from today. And I'll say that because it's not my data. Um, the blue, and where this comes from, by the way, is US census data, simply big data processed by Kaufman. All right, this is not a survey. This is the entire US economy from 1977 to 2005. And what you're looking at is job creation in the United States for a, for a three-decade period. Spans multiple economic cycles. The blue is jobs created by startups each year. And the dark color here, black, is jobs created, or if it's a negative number, destroyed by all other companies in the United States. All existing firms is the black if you don't count the startups. And what it's showing is that Startups, and this is on net, so if a startup creates 10 jobs but go, goes out of business the next year, then that would be zero, not 10, just to be clear. It's showing on net, startups are creating about 3 million jobs in the United States every year. 
and existing companies are destroying, on average, about a million jobs every year. Said a different way, what's happening, and this shouldn't be a surprise to us, but this was a huge surprise. If those of you who follow this stuff, when, this, when they first released this, I learned about it because the, the chairman of the President's Council of Economic Advisors showed this slide at a talk in D.C. and he said, we now think we understand better how jobs are being created. What it's saying is that our economy has a kind of a circle of life, like in The Lion King, that the existing businesses get older, they eventually die, they're replaced by new businesses. This shouldn't be a surprise. What's a surprise is how fast it's happening. And it's also interesting that this is 1977 we're talking about. This is before all the internet and all the hype that we're currently talking about. This is just a phenomenon that's been part of our economy for a very long time. The other thing it says, it says a lot of things to me. The other thing it says is if, if we're not good at creating startups in our economy, we're screwed. And if you don't think that's true, think of a place that is, is really bad at creating new enterprise. And, you'll, and think about what's going on with our unemployment, and you'll see that the two are linked. And I won't, I won't name names, uh, but you, there are a number of countries that you could look at that follow this pattern. Okay, so if you believe this, this is the first part of the question, yep. then you say, we've got to figure this out. We've got to figure out what mechanisms out there will bring more new company creation into the economy. So the second piece, and this is good news, is that it seems to be working incredibly well in St. Louis. Mm -hmm. St. Louis is one of the lower venture capital invested per capita states in the United States, I mean, Missouri, I should say. Um, so this is not, you know, this is not San Francisco, this is not New York, this is not Boston. Um, and by the way, I have to say this, uh, I need to, uh, th them spiting words from Bing talking about, you know, Boston and things not working necessarily. I don't know if Bing checked, but venture capital invested per capita, Massachusetts is 30% higher than California, thank you very much. Okay. Back to the program. Um, so, Bing, come on out. <laughs> yeah, Bing, where are you? Uh, so, back to the, back to the program. So, we opened in St. Louis uh, six months ago. We're the largest facility for growing startup companies outside the coast in the United States. There, so this is not a small operation. We did about 120,000 square feet, and we are uh, we have wet laboratories and you know all of that stuff. Uh, we're six months in. Uh, we're about two-thirds full, um, which tells you that the, 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 the level of activity, the companies that are coming in are strong. We have three venture funds that have relocated or set up shop. Two of them are new. One of them relocated. The relocated one was Boeing into the facility. So what we're finding is that this kind of concentration effect is happening. Um, and St. Louis was, in this sense, in a startup sense, considered, again, a quieter city. Uh, we started doing uh, weekly entrepreneur and investor gatherings in St. Louis. We do these in Boston. We call it Venture Cafe. Uh, in Boston, we draw 350, 400 people every week to these, and we think that's a good thing. In St. Louis, we started with 50 and then 100. We're now drawing 600 to 650 people every week, bigger than what's happening in Boston. And so it's a metric. I, I share this number because it's a metric for us of the level of energy and, and excitement that, you that you're finding. It's too early to tell whether we're going to uh, see the next Google or the next uh, Locker Dome would be a big St. Louis startup sure. come out of this energy. So I can't tell you that, but what I can tell you is that the concentrator effect does seem to be working. So one thing, I know a bunch of us are going to go look at the Almano site tomorrow, uh, the Cortex District. Uh, where you're located and Mark is located, is 200 acres, and it's essentially dis a district created by Wash U, Barnes Jewish Medical, St. Louis University, the Botanical Gardens, um, and then powers dedicated to the district around tax reform. Including for taking that, powers. Including take, and I mean, domain and, and, and TIFs. Yeah. So it's, it's an interesting model, and out of that grows folks move so, it in. So just to be clear, the place where we are, this was not in the super, super, th this was where, a, an old warehouse that had been vacant for a number of years uh, where we located. Um, it, this in tech shop is going into what was a, you know, an old empty building, empty for many, many years, and that's now being completely reconstructed. Uh, so you can take parts of the city where it, weren't, it wasn't happening and, and make it happen. So this is a point that I want to impress on all of you, but I'm looking particularly at Mr. Mayor here. The, when we think about public infrastructure in this country, we typically think about roads and bridges and airports and these sorts of things. And if we look at what we invest in public infrastructure, we usually have a lot of zeros associated with those projects. New highway project be in the billions, new airport project in the billions. 
If this is true, if the job creation fact numbers are true, it's interesting that we invest very little in what I'll call innovation infrastructure. We're very good at education infrastructure, and in fact, Pittsburgh is phenomenal at it, right? Pittsburgh is some of the best schools in the country. But, and you, you can't stop there. So if you, if you have the, the research and the education and the learning and the talent coming out of the schools, you need to somehow convert that. You need to carbon fix that, if you will, in the soil locally. And so you need to invest in that next piece. I'm not saying you're not, by the way. This whole, this whole building is a great example of one of these investments. So this is not a criticism. This is an encouragement for those things that you're doing. Invest in that infrastructure, which converts the output from your universities into economic activity in your town. And one of the things that Bing said that I totally agree with is that kids come out of school and they want to be non-embarrassed when they explain to their friends what they're going to go do. So it's got to be cool. It's got to be, there's got to be a lot of energy put into this. This has to be not a little thing, but a big thing, a city transforming thing. So here's a blue sky question off of Twitter from Sean Luther. Uh, if concentrators are a 3.0 startup support system, what is the 4.0 version and how can Pittsburgh make that happen? So assume sky's the limit here. Are there things you've been thinking well, about? Well, that's actually, who asked this is a great question. <laughs> Sean Raise Luther. Raise your hand, Sean. All right. <laughs> Um, so, uh, so I'm working on 4.0 in Rotterdam, Netherlands right now. Uh, Rotterdam is the largest port in Europe. It's the, it's the business city of the Netherlands. They say make your money in Rotterdam and spend it in Amsterdam. Um, the, uh, so th this is a, is a ph phenomenal city. And we asked ourselves, like, well, how do we take it up a notch? And, and so here's, here's our plan. Uh, we're working on, um, I guess I can't say don't tweet this. We're working on acquiring an extremely large building. We're looking at two. One of them was the largest building in Europe when it was built. And so this is a very large structure. And turning the entire thing into kind of a, an innovation campus. Uh, so uh, not just startups. Uh, we've observed in our CIC experience that uh, when, when uh, our friends at Google grew too big for us, which happened around the 200 person mark, they started looking for where they could grow to. And they looked elsewhere in our building. They couldn't do it. So they moved about a block away. Um, Amazon moved into our building with one person. They grew to about 80. And then they moved to the building next door and now have space for 700. Facebook moved into our building. And Apple moved into our building just in the last couple of years. And each have grown from a couple of people to 30 and, and 100, respectively. So the What's, what's happening is these, when you build the beacon, these larger firms also want to be part of the party. And so we're, we're envisioning an innovation campus, which is massive and very interconnected, that operates like a small city. And the principles with which we, we run it are urban design principles. They're not real estate principles. So we could talk about that all sure. day. But Last question. Um, when Angela Blackwell spoke this morning, she talked about baking in equity from the get-go. And if you go to your building or to Kendall Square, you could walk three blocks and you're on a public housing yeah. development. And so it's, it, it's unlike the science parks and suburban innovative corridors. Poverty is not, not out of sight, out of mind in central cities. But it is addressable. So uh, an interesting program that I would, so, so w the way we think about baking in equity and actually, the way we think about building innovation ecosystems is the same thing. We do a series of experiments. Right. So we have, a, we have a, a body that identifies hacks on a city that seem to work, and we fund them. And we, in, in, uh, we, in St. Louis and in Rotterdam, we've got the public sector to sort of create a pool of funds that can be allocated to these hacks. So one of these hacks is a group called Launch Code. Has anybody heard of Launch Code? Mm -hmm. Uh, so this is a Jim McKelvey thing. President Obama mentioned it in his recent economic speech as one of the examples of things that's working. I didn't invent this. It's a bunch of local St. Louis people with a great idea. Uh, they uh, came up with a methodology to take those people that Bing mentioned that don't have any coding background and very rapidly train them up as experienced coders, not people who have this, just the technical skills but the, but the way to do it. Uh, it involves pair programming and getting existing companies with existing programming jobs to create a second seat in their offices today for someone who is the, the pair programmer. I could tell you more after if you want to be a t chat at the uh, reception. But the basic idea is uh, you bring people with no skills in, you pair them up with someone for six months, and they come out experienced. 
They had a 98% placement rate in this program. It's about 50% minority. Uh, they just started their new version called Coder Girls. They had 350 women show up on the first night. They do this weekly sessions. Um, there are phenomenally effective, which are, which are also majority minority participants. Um, so, so there are absolutely ways to make these industries inclusive. It just doesn't happen necessarily by itself. You have to do it. So let's end where there. My, my only gratuitous advice um, is over the past several years, we've taken uh, a group of folks from other cities to Kendall and to Cambridge Innovation Center. Um, and these were folks who were thinking about, because they had the organic growth of an innovation district, really understanding what's the secret sauce. And I can say, whether it was Detroit or Atlanta um, or Philly or any number of other places, they walked away from Kendall and from the Boston Innovation District, uh, where District Hall is located. Part of our operation. Yeah. Completely changing what their plan was. So 3.0, yeah. I guess. Thank you, thank Tim Thank Rowe. you very much. Thanks, thanks, thank you.